207,255 cases of syphilis were reported in 2022. That's an 80% increase from 2018 per the CDC. Here's an infographic from the CDC's SCI surveillance report that really highlights the importance of why we need to make sexually transmitted infections a public health priority. 1.6 million cases of chlamydia, 650,000 reports of gonorrhea, and to add to those syphilis numbers, 3,800 cases of syphilis amongst newborns. We've got to do a better job of removing the negative stigma behind sexually transmitted infections and make testing and treatment more accessible. Having said that, I also acknowledge why people may question the medical and healthcare system. Transparency, which is exacerbated by the general public's inability to articulate their own thought process and taking statements at face value. Hard to know what's behind all that smoke in today's society. One of my preceptors I highly look up to mentioned during our syphilis topic discussion whether I knew what the Tuskegee study was. At the time, I never craved across that study, but I'm extremely appreciative for the insight and perspective it gave me. Why is it something I didn't learn in school or come across? Is it more of a matter of out of sight, out of mind? Hello there farmers and friends, Mark at FarmWise. Welcome to the Code Blue Debrief, a clinical pharmacotherapy, YouTube, and podcast. I'm a board certified emergency medicine pharmacist that makes clinical pharmacotherapy content on the social medias. I post daily infographics, reels, and patient cases. Follow at FarmWise on your favorite platform. You can find my accounts most easiest by going to my links bio at links.farmwise.com. You can help me out and get all the farmers and friends together by hitting the like and follow button to help with the platform's algorithm. Let's get back to that syphilis topic discussion. Initially called the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. Like what? We actually had study titles like this in the past? The United States Public Health Service collaborated with the Tuskegee Institute to study the natural history of syphilis back in 1932. The title was changed to The Untreated Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. Let's not forget here, educate yourself and grow perspective without generalizing to the extreme. Trust me, we'll cover lots of odd government funded projects relating to medicine and pharmacy. They evaluated 600 black men, 399 with syphilis and 201 without. This was during a time when informed consent wasn't required. For anyone involved with patients and research, you're probably familiar with city training. Patients were told that they were being treated for quote, end quote, bad blood. A general term used for syphilis, anemia, and fatigue. During the study, patients were withheld the known treatment, which is penicillin. Keeping in mind, this was known well beforehand and already discovered in 1943. Patients received free medical care, food vouchers, and burial insurance. This went on until 1972 when finally, an Associated Press article shed some light on the study, and subsequently, the trial was terminated due to being ethically unjustified. No shit. Here's an official apology from the ex-president Bill Clinton. Study participants and their families settled for an out-of-court settlement of a grand total of $10 million back in 1973. Times have changed since then, but really, that wasn't that long ago. Gain some more perspective so that you can come to your own opinion and have a better understanding of different backgrounds before holding judgment. What's the big deal with syphilis anyway? Just like any other sickly transmitted infection, we've got really bad problems when left untreated. It's actually a fairly simple treatment, the good old penicillin shot. We'll dig into the clinical presentation of syphilis, background of diagnostics, and treatments for different forms of syphilis in addition to CNS involvement. Syphilis, the silent infection. Those 207,255 cases of syphilis reported by the CDC in 2022 were actually the most cases of syphilis reported since 1950. Out here breaking records, America, what are we doing? Syphilis is a systemic, sexually transmitted infection from Triponema pallidum, a spirochete bacterium. Syphilis has two modes of transmission. It can be transmitted from humans to humans via vaginal, anal, or oral sex. The other method of transmission is called vertical, 
which is passing the bloodstream from the mother to fetus during pregnancy. Those 3,800 new congenital syphilis cases in 2022 was a 183% increase from 2018. We need to bring more awareness about the surge of syphilis, appropriate testing in high-risk patients, and ensure timely antimicrobial treatment. Clinical presentation and staging. Treatment is dependent on stage of infection, primary, secondary, latent, or tertiary. Latent syphilis more distinguishes asymptomatic patients. It's then characterized into early or late, which is defined by onset of symptoms or defined infection within or after 12 months of exposure, respectively. Primary is characterized by a single, painless, rubbery, or indurated anal genital or oral ulcers. Secondary involves mucocutaneous eruptions, condylomalata, or mucus patches. The tertiary stage more resembles late sequelae of syphilis with organ involvement, such as cardiac syphilis with aortic aneurysms, granulomatosis lesions invading tissue, and late stages of CNS infections. When syphilis gets into your brain and remains untreated, this can lead to ocular or neurosyphilis. Ocular syphilis can present as flashes, floaters, unilateral or bilateral vision loss, while neurosyphilis can have symptoms that resemble meningitis or stroke-like symptoms, such as altered mental status, palsy, impaired balance, and headaches. Now that we have a suspicion for syphilis, given the presentation, let's talk about diagnostics and why they're so important as they are tricky. Serologic tests and diagnostics. Testing for comeback disease of the century is difficult since several factors contribute to false positives and negatives. A presumptive diagnosis requires two serologic tests, a triponemal and non-triponemal test. Non-triponemal tests include venereal disease, research laboratory, or VDRL, or rapid plasma reagent test, or RPR, while triponemal exams consist of passive, particulate, agglutination, and other assays. The CDC recommends a reverse algorithm for syphilis screening, but standardized practices may differ at your facility. Here's an example. You have a suspicion for syphilis in patient zero, Marcus. We do a non trypanemal test, and in this case, an RPR, it comes back positive. We will need to do a confirmatory triponemal test. If this also comes back positive, we have a diagnosis. It's important to note that with RPRs, they result with titers. There may be times where both are positive, often than those who have recurrent infections. Significant changes in titers resemble an acute infection in these patients. Oh sugar, Marcus is having an acute mental status change and popped a fever. In patients we have a suspicion for neurosyphilis or cranial nerve dysfunctions, we need additional testing from cerebral spinal fluid. Isolated ocular symptoms with reactive serologic tests wouldn't be included. For a diagnosis of neurosyphilis, we would need a combination of three things. Acute neurologic symptoms, reactive serologic tests, and positive CSF findings via the cell count or VDRL. Why do pharmacists need to know diagnostics? Well, we need to be proactive and anticipate the right treatment while optimizing pharmacotherapy based on patient-specific parameters. First line treatment, penicillin. Syphilis needs to be a bigger discussion amongst our patients, especially in those who are at high risk since this can be life-threatening when untreated, yet easily treatable when detected. As mentioned earlier, treatment is based on stages. Parenteral penicillin is the preferred therapy. Dosing, route, and administration is dependent on stage and severity. Penicillin is a beta-lactam that breaks the cell wall of bacteria to induce its bactericidal properties. For primary and secondary syphilis, we would treat both of these stages the same, with penicillin benzathine 2.4 million units intramuscularly for one dose. What makes this formulation different than other formulations of penicillin? The benzathine salt formulation provides a slow, prolonged absorption. Probably not a good idea to give it as an IV push. Patients with tertiary syphilis without CNS involvement will get PEN-G benzathine 2.4 million units intramuscularly once weekly for three weeks. Patients presenting with neurosyphilis 
will likely need admission for IV, penicillin G, potassium. These patients will receive 24 million units of Pen G potassium in a day for 10 to 14 days, which can be given as continuous infusion or in divided doses. Sounds like a complicated therapy, but it's better than having permanent deficits. For patients without concerns for compliance, the CDC recommends an alternative of Pen G procaine 2.4 million units daily in addition to oral probenicid 500 milligrams by mouth four times daily for 10 to 14 days. Why are we using a gout medication for an infection? Understanding pharmacokinetics is actually cool nowadays. Probenicid was initially created to decrease the clearance of penicillin back in the 1940s. It does this by inhibiting a specific renal tubule transporter to penicillin, which prolongs serum concentrations and bactericidal properties. When patients are initially treated, there is the concern for Jarich Hersheimer reactions. Patients may experience fevers, flushing, lesions, and leukocytosis after starting treatment. It's been proposed that lysing of spirochetes releases lipoproteins that induce pro-inflammatory mediators. Be mindful in pregnant women when being treated for syphilis, as it's been reported that this reaction can occur in up to 40% of mothers. The erection is often self-limiting, but can be life-threatening in rare cases. Early testing, detection, and treatment. I'm all for America breaking records, but an 80% increase in syphilis cases since 2018 is just eye-watering, especially taking into account the data behind sexually transmitted infections across the board. Earlier detection, prevention, and treatment are crucial for syphilis alongside other sexually transmitted infections. Removing the negative stigma and getting patient buy-in starts with your personal interactions. Syphilis is a systemic, sexually transmitted infection from Triplonema pallidum, a spirochete bacterium. There's high rates of false positives and negatives with syphilis diagnostics. A presumptive diagnosis of syphilis requires a reactive, non-triplonemal, and triplonemal serologic test. Those with concerns of neurosyphilis and cranial nerve abnormalities will need CSF testing, a combination of positive, CSF findings on the cell count, or VDRL, reactive serologic tests, and neurologic symptoms point towards a diagnosis for neurosyphilis. Primary and secondary syphilis are treated with penicillin G benzathine, 2.4 million units intramuscularly for one dose, while tertiary without CNS involvement is treated with 2.4 million units once weekly intramuscularly for three weeks. Forms of CNS involvement, including ocular and neurosyphilis, will be treated with Pen-G potassium, 24 million units in a day, via continuous infusion or in divided doses. There are no alternatives to penicillin for syphilis in pregnant women. Those with true allergies to penicillin will need desensitization and arrange for penicillin treatment. Thanks for staying to the end of this episode. Let me know in the comments below, what are your thoughts on the uptrend of syphilis cases in the United States. Just makes me think that it's probably gonna be some kind of infectious disease that takes out humanity, not an asteroid or a nuke. Doesn't really sound fun unless it includes some zombies. For more farm facts in the drug bank, hit the like and follow button for more. Watch the next video, and I hope you learned something new.